understand. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Yeah. <laughs>
morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the third Sunday of the in August, clear in person, other folks in person, uh, just a brief you. Also, glad to have Luke back singing with us again today before he heads north to Michigan. We hope they will be able to understand the southern drawl he has with the Walker County DFAC to be Secret Santas this year. If you are interested in that information, uh, you can see me or David after church, or you can reach out, I'm sure, on their website or their Facebook page. Everybody's got a Facebook page now for uh, Walker County uh, Department of Family and Children's Services. So lots going on, lots of good things happening in the life of this church and this community in this special time of year. Are there prayer concerns that, I want, that we want folks to know of this day? Yes, thank you. Uh, my brother Keith, who lives in Nashville, uh, I've seen some pictures. Um, in fact, his community, of course, was very close to those tornadoes. One was within a half mile of his home, and other than having a few tree branches down and the rest of the leaves in his yard, they are okay. They haven't had power or heat now for well over 24 hours and don't know when they're going to be getting it back, uh, but they have set up um, for a number of people at the church, and there's roads clear and people can get to their church. They have heat and hot chocolate and... Um, but a number of pictures he has sent of homes just really devastated in that area. And, of course, that continued on as part of that storm system that went through Kentucky. And uh, so prayers there. I know the Presbyterian uh, Disaster Assistance already has folks on the ground. And while the church does give towards that, if you are looking for a way to donate, you can always go through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance or a number of other fine organizations as well. Thank you for reminding me, Sydney. Are there others? Then let us go to worshiping God in spirit and in truth this day. And let Clay grab his bulletin so he can follow along. Please join me in the call to worship. A voice calls out in the wilderness. It, it sings, sings of a home, home for all. It speaks of justice and peace. We, ch we could choose to ignore it. We, we could drown out that song. song. We, we could, could choose not, not to listen. listen. Instead, we come into this space. We let the world grow quiet. We listen. A voice calls out in the wilderness. Do you hear it? We hear it. It's listening and worship. Let us draw near to God. And for the lighting of the Advent candle, Please stand as you're able and join in singing hymn number 464, Joyful, Joyful.
succeeding. It takes courage to tell the truth. John the Baptist knew it. His job as a prophet certainly could not have been easy. And you and I know it. Our job as people of faith to create a home for all has never been easy. In our prayer of confession, we may channel, may we channel some of John the Baptist's courage to tell the truth about ourselves and our world. We do not do this to shame ourselves or guilt ourselves for being imperfect. We speak the truth out loud because we know that we cannot grow and change without first being honest. So let us be brave. Let us be bold. Let us be truth tellers as we confess together now to a God who couldn't love us any more than God already does. Please join in the unison prayer of confession. Expansive God, we know that the church is in your house, and your house has room for everyone. Yet too often, instead of setting the table for our neighbors, we block the door. Instead of welcoming all, we judge others by our own standards. Instead of sharing our second coat, we hide it in the attic, holding on to fear instead of letting go with love. Remind us that your home is a home for all, that truth requires hard work, that truth requires uncomfortable justice. Help us to be bold enough to see it and brave enough to live it. With hope, we pray. Please continue in silent prayer. Our assurance of pardon. Family of faith, God sent prophets like John the Baptist to us because this work is not easy. Helping create a world where all might have a home and all might be loved and all might know peace is an audacious goal. Fortunately for us, when we mess up, when we lose our way or forget our call, we are met with grace. God could not love us any more or any less than God already does. So rest in this good news. We are at home with God, forgiven, claimed, and loved. The door is always open for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Well, let's pass the peace in the continued socially distanced, acceptable manner. Make Sydney happy. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, whose love is like the sun warming me from the inside, if you are my home, then your word is the street light guiding me there. So I want you to know I am walking your way. We are walking your way. And we are looking for a light. And our feet are dirty. We've lost our way a time or two. And our bags are heavy. We're carrying an array of grief and fear on our backs but we're on our way. We're looking for your light. We're listening for your word. When you see us coming, when you feel our hearts move, we hope you will run down the driveway and catch us. Leave the light on. We are on our way home.
Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your hearts, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change the shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home, at that time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all of the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Our second reading comes from the the book of Luke, Luke. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, not 1 through 18, 13, because that doesn't exist. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trunconitis, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Capus, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do now? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary but the chaff will burn and with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
interested and he chose to call me out on the one mistake I made in the bulletin, I think because she was mad that the scripture included all those crazy words that she couldn't pronounce. I will hear about that on the way home, I'm sure. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, you who art our strength and our redeemer in Christ. Amen. So, what I realized was more than just a number of years ago, my my dad, who was a Presbyterian pastor at at his church, the church he was at for for over 30 years and retired from before he went back to work, that that sort of a thing, um, began to build a new building, a sanctuary actually. Now, there were things that I was interested in while growing up, but construction had never been one of them. But but I was a youth elder on the session and had gotten put on the capital campaign building committee, so I was more than interested in this particular building. Also, because it was about all that my dad could talk about, he had a lot invested in it. So, so our whole family was, was more than a little bit excited about the prospect of this building. Now, as we prepared and thought and dreamed about this building, groups of us would go wandering off into the woods that was the church property. We would discuss and dream about where this building might be, how it might be laid out, you know, looking through the trees. And as you can imagine, there were lots of thoughts and ideas and opinions about this building. Suddenly in our church, there were a number of people who, although they were accountants and nurses by day, were building construction experts by night, and and especially sanctuaries. It it was amazing, sort of like all the epidemiologists who have appeared out of nowhere during this pandemic. Now, Presbyterians do things decently and in order. That means we do it slow. So, So it took a while, but eventually, eventually we got most everybody to agree and a decision was made and a contractor was hired and money was raised and a loan was secured and it was time to start building this building. But of course, we still went for walks in the woods. In fact, on the first walk after we hired a contractor, I was walking in the woods with my dad. There were a couple other men who had moved over that way, and and I saw an orange sign I hadn't seen before along the roadway there at Bells Ferry Road. It had words on it that said, Land Disturbance Permit. I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad... What is a land disturbance permit? Is this a new thing? Should you have gotten one last week when you had me disturb all of our yard and plant those azaleas? He laughed and he looked at me like he had failed as a father. He explained to me by reading the sign that that a land disturbance permit or an LDP It's required on all sites disturbing one or more acres or on sites less than that, but which a larger portion of that development will disturb a cumulative or one or more acre over the life of the project. He explained to me that the four puny azaleas I had planted were not anywhere near an acre but that the church, the church would disturb far more than that. He then asked me if in my 17 years had I never noticed such a sign like this before. I said I had not, and he shook his head. I often think of that head shake any time I hear my children say something to me that they should know, and I shake my head. 
I think it's an inherited trait that fathers get. Since that time, however, I have noticed land disturbance signs regularly, almost annoyingly so. You, you know, somebody like will, will tell you about a commercial they've seen on TV. You, you've been watching the same shows and you've never seen that commercial until they've mentioned it. Now it comes on all over the place. Or you buy a car thinking you've got something new and unique, something like a, a, a Toyota RAV, only to see after you have bought it that everyone has one of those. Or, 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 or something else on the TV, you know, they always mention some show, some movie that you've never seen, and, and they look at you like you're crazy, and then every time you turn on the tube, it's there. Wait, they don't have tubes anymore in them, do they? Every time you turn on the plasma flat screen hanging on the wall, it's there. You, you get what I'm saying. So, so now I notice land disturbance permits. Every time I drive past a site and I see something coming along, I noticed it. And then I'll notice within a very few days that a lot of activity begins on that site. And yet very little of it, at least initially, has to do with hammers and nails and wood and shingles and electrical stuff. Instead, it has to do with bobcats and bulldozers and chainsaws and, and, and dumpster trucks either bringing in clean dirt or, or hauling away debris. You see, initially, building is about clearing off and, and leveling the ground. It, it's about preparing the earth and making it ready for something new to be built on. Sometimes, sometimes it's even about removing unsafe or dilapidated or out-of-date structures so that something better and safer for all can be built. You see, if you don't do this, and you don't do this right, the structures will never last if they're even able to be built. And if you do the ground preparation cheaply or without care, it can lead to all kinds of long-term problems. I know about this secondhand, thanks be to God. You see, my brother-in-law, that, that's my sister's husband, and, and, and my grandparents, they lived in a neighborhood with such problems. Now, now my, my sister lived directly across the street from my grandmother. It's just how it worked out. And as that neighborhood got old, you know, about 10 or 15 years, problems in backyards across that neighborhood started to arise or actually sink. You know, sinkholes began to form. Seeing the builder had taken all of the, the leftover debris and, and put it in the backyards and covered it up with dirt, it, it was a cost-saving measure. The problem is that that stuff deteriorates and rots over time, and sinkholes begin to form in backyards. The ground just suddenly gives way. Now, in my grandparents' case, it wasn't that big a deal. It, it was far enough in the back, but other than making it really difficult to mow or grow anything, and it looking sort of funny out there, like maybe it was a bunker for, for, for a golf course, there was no real damage. Others, however, had decks fall completely off houses. And my brother-in-law... My brother-in-law's sinkhole was underneath the in-ground pool and that concrete. That pool just kept getting deeper and deeper. The deep end got really adventurous over time. They eventually had to get it fixed before it affected the foundation of the house. I don't know how much it cost him, but suddenly my brother-in-law was charging admission to use the pool. Friends, in today's text, we hear of the one God sent to prepare the ground for God's Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
The message by Eugene Peterson interprets Luke 3, verses 4 through 6 in this way. It's a little bit easier to read, Sidney. It says this, John the Baptist went all through the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of life change leading to forgiveness of sins as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Thunder in the desert. Prepare God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. Every ditch, every ditch shall be filled in. Every bump smoothed out. The detour straightened out, all the ruts paved over. Everyone will be there to see the parade of God's salvation. Now that sounds like a pretty good land disturbance to me. You see, if John the Baptist did anything, he disturbed the landscape that was the first century world of Palestine into which Jesus was born. John came into the world in amazement, as we talked about last week, to to a couple that that was beyond their childbirth and years. And then he came out of the wilderness, and and if we had read some of the descriptions of him, he's dressed a little funny, you know, in camel's hair and, and, and eating a diet of locust and such. But more than his strange dress and awful diet, which often gets ours and and artists' attention. By the way, if you want something interesting to do this afternoon, just go Google art pictures of John the Baptist. You're going to find some interesting stuff there. If we had a PowerPoint screen, I might show a few to you. But I think sometimes those images get in the way of the words because his words, are even more profound. Years ago, years ago, I was in Dr. Gaines's Presbyterian College Choir. I'm not sure how good I was. I'm certainly not as talented as, as Luke that you're going to hear in a few minutes. But traditionally at that time, very few males tried out for the Presbyterian College Choir. And while I was proud that I got in, looking back on it, every male who tried out that day made the choir. Now, one of the dreams every college choir professor has is to put on at least once every four years Handel's Messiah at Christmas. Now, most of you are familiar with with one song in it, the, the Hallelujah Chorus. You you know that song, it's famous, it's when the king, who I think got a cramp in his leg, stood up to stretch, and everybody stood up with him, and now even to this day, the hallelujah chorus comes up, and everybody gets to stand up and stretch, sort of like the first part of our worship here, where we're up, down, up, and down, little Presbyterian calisthenics going on. Now, Handel used the King James Version for the text. Of his, of his musical masterpiece. The text in the King James Version says, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made smooth. And all flesh shall see it together. I sang that line four million times before we got it right in the baritone section. But these words from Isaiah and John not only make up a big part of Handel's Messiah, but they're words that help frame even modern movements like the civil rights movement of the 1960s. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. used these same prophetic words found in Isaiah and John the Baptist to proclaim a message of justice for all people. These words of the prophets, it seems, are passed from generation to generation. Wherever there is a need for a prophetic word and witness to be spoken, and these words are etched into the collective memory of the people who hear them. And thus, these words appear every time the ground needs leveling 
or compromise structures near cleaning off. And the landscape, it, so the landscape is able to become the beloved community, to quote the late John Lewis. Reverend Gwen Garrity, who is the artist for the series we are using and whose beautiful artwork is on the bulletin cover, writes the following about this text. Perhaps the path towards creating a home for all requires some deconstruction. Some of our structures are rotting. Some of our institutions are compromised. Some of our rituals need repair. And yet nothing is beyond redemption. Collective belonging gives way for collective joy. Joy that is free and full. So what is it that makes this poetic words of the prophets timeless? Well, one of my favorite theologians, Walter Brueggemann, refers to this phenomenon of the prophets as prophetic imagination. You see, the prophetic imagination is an act of seeing the world as it is, but daring to put the words of God on the world and see the world as God would have it be. It's how Mother Teresa saw lepers in Calcutta, lepers impoverished and forgotten by society, but through her prophetic imagination, dared to imagine a world where the love of God is available even to them. Oh, friends, it's so right that John appears every Advent crying out in the wilderness and pushing us to remove those things that keep us from being able to have a strong foundation for our home for Christ to enter. Now, if you haven't figured it out, all this poetry and all this discussion I have shared about the the land being made ready for the kingdom to be built upon, it, it isn't physical ground at all. It's something more important and far more valuable. It's about our lives and how we live them both individually and in communities. Now, this kind of poetry of Isaiah and John and Jesus and and Dr. King is indeed beautiful. Yes, let us fill the rocky places. Let them be made smooth, level the ground, fill in the ruts of our lives. And even with John going off on that brood of vipers and sounding like a coach in the locker room after a bad loss, I've been there, fussing it as players, those folks in the congregation, in the crowd that day, should have acted like we did in the locker room. They should have nodded their heads and agreed and said, oh, we'll do better. What's the closing hymn, preacher John the Baptist? Instead, these folks made a mistake. They said, they asked John what he meant. Don't ever ask a preacher what they mean. They might just tell you. The text says, John, what should we do, the crowd asked. And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. And the tax collectors even came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. And then the soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And suddenly, by them asking those questions, John goes from preaching to meddling. He goes after not just the religious elite, which we find in Matthew's gospel, but instead he goes after everybody. He goes after the entire community, pointing out the injustices he sees. And in both Matthew and in Luke, he doesn't mince any words about it. The Reverend Dr. Judith Jones was a professor of biblical studies for nearly two decades prior to retiring and then returning back to full-time parish ministry. 
In one of her writings, she wrote the following about this passage. John's challenge to fruitful living prompts a series of questions from his repentant hearers. What then shall we do? The first question from the crowd comes from the crowd in general, and John replies to the whole group, Do you own two shirts? Then you have more than you need. Do you have food? Give some away. He leaves no wiggle room for those who might be tempted to say, but, but I'm not rich. The command is absolute. Some people in your community don't have enough to survive, so if you have something, share it. The next two queries from the tax collectors and the soldiers move beyond sharing to addressing behaviors that cause poverty. John tells the tax collectors and soldiers to stop abusing power in order to make more money. Don't take more than the minimum. Don't shake down people. Don't blackmail them. Be content with your wages. John's words show that he views poverty neither as an accident nor as a fault of the poor. In this time, as in, in his time, as in ours, the earth produced more than enough goods to feed and clothe everyone. The problem then and now is that resources have been grabbed up by a very small percentage of the population. John called not only the, on the wealthiest, but also the merely comfortable to treat their accumulation of goods as directly related to the seriousness of their repentance. How we get money and how we use money exposes what we value. Economic issues are spiritual issues. If we ignore God's command to practice social and economic justice, how can we claim that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? If we prioritize our pleasures above our neighbor's basic necessity, how can we claim to love our neighbors as ourselves? He goes on to say, John calls his hearers to let God burn up selfish desires to hoard food and clothes even when one's neighbor is hungry and shivering with cold. John declares that all those things that get in the way of love for God and neighbor must go. It is then we can live as God's own people, aflame with love and committed to justice. It seems that she too has some kind of a prophetic imagination, doesn't she? Yes, the crowd ask, and so do we. John, what should we do? Friends, John's answer is rather simple, almost kindergartenish. He says, be kind. Do everyday justice. That's John's response. Oh, he uses economic justice examples, but it boils down to loving humans. Loving others, it boils down to living out the values that we proclaim. In order to produce what John describes and later Jesus builds upon as an analogy of good fruit, we have to be about doing good work. Friends, this is one of the essential ways we make the land of our world and our hearts ready for Jesus to come and build the kingdom of God means we must live with, with at least a touch of prophetic imagination and worldview. It means just like I did with my dad. When I walked through those woods and we dreamed of a sanctuary where there was nothing but rocky soil, lots of trees, and even as I discovered later, poison ivy, that's an entirely different story. We have to envision a world where God's justice and love and mercy reigns. John's message has some very real life implications for us seeking to build the kingdom of God, and it's about loving and accepting people where they are, no matter who they are. As Elder Centron Olivieri states in her analysis of the text, 
If our flesh shall see the salvation of God, we all have a part to play in the salvation story. If loving valleys and right and riding wrong places, like John, we are also called to a specific time and place, here and now. Be at the ready and bear fruit worthy of repentance. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, give voice to the silence and oppressed, speaking truth to power and protecting and empowering the vulnerable. Let our collective voice cry out in the wilderness and everywhere with exhortations and good news. And as the message is heard, more and more people will join us in building the kingdom of God, making it truly a home for all. Friends, that's what these letters are about. That's what this money that we give is about. It's about proclaiming the good news of God and seeing a world where rights might be made wrong, where no child will go hungry or abused, where no one will go to bed hungry at night or cold. And as we do this, as we go about doing this as a community and as individuals, we are living Advent. You see, Advent is more than about pulling off tabs on a calendar. You know, you can buy all kinds of Advent calendars, I've discovered. You, you can buy them with, with Harry Potter and, and Star Wars. There, there's some ladies in my office that, that have a calendar that has something to do with wine. I don't have wine bottles. I, I don't understand all there is about it. And, and all that is well and good and fun. But Advent is more than that. It's about preparing our hearts for our Lord. Now, David will tell you, I don't usually make very many requests regarding music. I really try to leave it to the experts. And even though I was in the Presbyterian College Choir, and, and, and I did get to perform in the musical, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, as, as I was Linus, and I have told you this many occasions, it, it, was, it was Tony Award worthy. I usually let David pick the songs that will be shared at the offertory. And yes, even though Luke is singing, we can collect the offertory as long as we do it quietly this week. But this week, I reached out to David and I said, if Luke is available, do you think he might sing a song for us? It was a song I recommended after it being listed in a blog, a blog listing hymns and musical suggestions for this, the third Sunday of Advent. It caught my eye because I know it's a Christmas song, but, but I really considered it more of a, a winter song and certainly not one that the congregation would sing. And, and I was skeptical as to why it was there. I mean, the hymn or, or the title of the song and, and, and the music sort of, if it's not sung right, can make you think of a cold, rainy day sort of like yesterday that, that we had. It lacks the upbeat jingle bells that, that you hear when you go in the department stores this time of year. Now, I usually avoid those, but I was sent with returns to Macy's. Those still exist, by the way. I, I heard them yesterday, and, and this song didn't come on. And yet, as I read the words, I realized they were perfect for this sermon. I want to share a few of them with you. The end of the song goes like this. What then can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. What then can I give him? I can give him my heart. Friends, both this season of Advent and John's words which were indeed much sharper than the song in the bleak midwinter that I just read, they call us to do the same thing, to prepare to give our hearts as an offering to God so that we may be used to proclaim the good news to the world that a Savior has come. A Savior has come for all. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your gender. 
It doesn't matter how you identify that gender. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your sexuality, how much money you make, how much money you don't make, how old you are, how young you are, how much hair you have, or... It doesn't matter. We are able to proclaim and share that hope and love and joy and the whole is available to the whole world. And friends, thanks be to God. We know that it comes to us as the true gift of Christmas. And the babe born in that manger who grows up to be our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe, help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the word and the word proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand and say that which we believe together. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The people asked John, what should we do? I've asked myself that a million times in my life. How do I make a difference? Can I really do anything that could help this hurting world? Is it already too late? Is it already too big? It can fe feel overwhelming at times, but John says, if you have two coats, give one away. It's all that easy, and it's all that hard. So friends, let us give our tithes and offerings now, knowing that these gifts help build a world where all have a home, where all are welcomed, fed, loved, and known. What shall we do? We should give what we have. Friends, it's that easy, and it's that hard. Let us give to God our tithes and our offering. In the bleak midwinter 
a stable place of fight. The Lord God incarnate, Jesus Christ, angels and archangels may have gathered there. Cherubim and seraphim from the air, but his mother only in her maiden bliss worship the beloved with kiss. What can I give? If I were a shepherd, I would bring lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him but my heart? join me now in the unison prayer of dedication that's found printed in your worship materials. Let us pray. God who welcomes us home, who creates space, who leaves a chair with our name on it, we have two goats and we are giving one away. That is what this offering is. It is our second coat. It is our hearts on our sleeves. It is our audacious hope that there can indeed be a better world than this one. So take these gifts and use them to move us closer to that promised day. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to a time of prayer. God of open doors and porch lights, of welcome mats and candles in the window, we cannot thank you enough for your open door policy. You are forever welcoming us home. In a world that puts handrails on park benches so that those without a roof over their heads cannot lay down, you offer something radically different. You welcome all of us just as we are. You paint a picture of a world that could be. You remind us that there is enough love to go around and that neighbor helping neighbor is who we are called to be. Thank you for the voice in the wilderness that calls to us. Thank you for the radical welcome and the unchanging love. Today, God, we give extra gratitude for the people and places that are home to us. But we also pray for all those without a home. We pray for immigrants, immigrants and refugees navigating the waters of trauma, change, and loss. 
We pray for those who experience homelessness and for those scraping together every coin to pay last month's rent. We pray for those who do not feel at home in their body, assigned a gender or an identity that does not fit their spirit. We pray for those who do not feel at home in your church, wounded by strict rules or judgmental accusations. We pray for those who long to build a home with another, but instead find themselves eating another meal alone. God, there are so many who need a home, so help us be builders of that new day. Give us the courage of John, who saw a way forward so clearly. Turn our words into action and our conviction into change. Gracious God, you are a God of open doors and welcome home celebrations. Teach us to be the same. And as we learn and as we grow, we continue to pray the words your Son taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn together. Clay's going to tell us what it is. Hymn number 38, it came on a midnight clear.
says as you leave this service, your service begins. Comfort the homesick, open your doors to other, seek sanctuary, be brave enough to go home by another way, and remember here in God's house, all are welcome. So come back soon. In the name of our foundation, God, Spirit, and Son, go in peace. Hallelujah. Amen.